hello, hello, hello. Uh, happy Friday. Welcome to the Friday edition of RLR. You may think that yesterday's case and uh, discussion has gotten to my head as I sit here on this ordinary chair with this light behind me. To worry not. Tansu and I remain as humble as possible, despite um, <laughs> despite <laughs> a mesmerizing and daunting case yesterday. What has changed, though, is that um, my wife and I are on a mini retreat in um, Big Sur. I was telling folks that uh, Big Sur is this really incredible place on the California coast. And we are in this like really nice cabin that has this very fancy chair. It's ridiculously com comfortable. I'm not going to move from it. And in fact, my next big purchase will probably be this chair somehow. It's so comfortable. But anyway, enough about me. Um, welcome to everybody. We're very, very excited to have you, uh, in large part because um, we've missed Prof. Rez on VMR, and he will be joining us momentarily. Um, at least I hope. I'm pretty confident he will. Um, but in the meantime, we'll pass the mic to get to know and introduce our uh, case presenter, who is presenting his first case on VMR. Hi, Prashant. Hello, hello, Dr. Ravi. Uh, uh, shall I introduce myself? Please. Yeah, uh, I'm Prasant Gyawali. I was born and raised in uh, Nepal, and I'm like right now, like presenting the case from Nepal too. Please. And it's almost ten forty-five p.m. here. Uh, yeah. Um, I first of all, like I, I will, I will say sorry if I sound like a. A little bit gibberish are like <laughs> confusing because I have I haven't slept because yesterday like last night I had a, I had my interview and my sleep cycle is like pretty uh, messed up right now. Oh my uh, god! Yeah. <laughs> Please don't apologize at all. That's so cool that you're uh, um, that you're calling from Nepal right now, and I imagine it's a busy time of the year for you. Um, yeah. where, where in Nepal are you from? Uh, I'm in the capital city Kathmandu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have been like currently living here like for past uh two years. Um, I was born in like southernmost part of Nepal, but right now I'm in the capital city. I see, wonderful. And you know, their timing is impeccable because Prof Rez just joined us. Prof Rez, we're getting to know our first time case presenter, Prashant, who's who is calling in and presenting uh from Nepal. Yeah. Wow, Prashant. First of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. But can we just, can someone take a picture of Robbie and post it on Twitter? Look at this guy. He Prof looks like Rez. right now. Prof oh my Rez. God. <laughs> Prof Rez, you got to come, you got to come earlier to the show, Prof Look Rez. at you, Rez. man. Like the wood behind you, that chair. Oh my God. This is what you deserve, Robbie. Prof Rez, we spent five minutes talking about my chair. I promise you. <laughs> we did it. We did it justice. And yes. Robbie, I don't think anybody thought to take a picture and embarrass me on Twitter. So thank you for Please, that. Someone take a picture, <laughs> tag me. We got to make this public. <laughs> I will claim it. I will claim it as AI and completely. I feel like right now you got to be like, hey, can someone live or die? In that <laughs> <laughs> like Reza. <laughs> Prof Rez, we get, we get this chair for one VMR. And then uh, don't worry, I'll be back to my PJs and my uh, chaotic lifestyle forever and ever and ever. <laughs> But I have to tell you, I did think twice about sitting here for VMR because I don't like the aura that it projects. But then I remembered um, it would be a great story. And this chair is so unbelievably comfortable, Prof Rez. Unbelievably comfortable. It's just, oh my gosh. Ugh. Anyway. Listen, it's it's consummate with your skills as a diagnostician. Oh yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know about that. I think this chair is larger than life, my friend. Uh, but uh, I, I look so small and uncomfortable in it, but uh, uncomfortable psychologically, very comfortable physically, extremely. By the way, Prashant, if you're worried about what you've got yourself into, I think that worry is justified. Um, on Friday, uh, Prof Rez and I are a little bit more disinhibited than our usual. <laughs> yeah, our it's, usual. it's a happy Friday, so yeah, I, I can understand. <laughs> Amazing. Prof Rez, do you have any questions for Prashant as we try to get to know him before he presents? I'll ask one question and then, Robbie, you tackle the first aliquot if that's okay with you. Uh, um, Prashant, tell me, what kind of activity do you like to do outside of the hospital? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a tracker and I like to 
uh, trek a lot and I have been trekking a lot in the mountains of Nepal. And fun fact, like I have a uh, cross uh, world highest pass that is a pathway between the mountain, which is called Thorungla Pass. It's even, uh, it's even high, it is situated in the altitude even higher than the Everest Space Camp. So I have crossed that pass two times. So I'm really into the trekking. Uh, and yeah, man, I love like watching movies and series a lot. <laughs> What's Besides, your favorite movie? Um, like uh, till now, I think Sasang Redemption is my favorite movie. Uh, and I watch series too, also anime also. I'm a One Piece fan. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Thank you so much, Prashant. Why don't we um, start the process and get this case going? Okay. Uh, so let's start with the chip complaint right now. Please. Okay. So my patient is like 52 year old man uh, who presented with the chief complaint of a single episode of syncope. Back to back syncope. Wow. Uh, Tatsu, I hope you're getting some jitters. Um, yesterday, Prashant, the chief con the yeah. was also syncope. Um, I and saw I saw that video in the YouTube. I yeah, wouldn't yeah. join, but I saw that case uh, in the YouTube. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I, I'm uh, I'm sure not everybody has had a chance to listen to it yet. It's definitely worth a listen to, but I'm sure your case today will be equally educational. And I think I that in this case is in stark contrast to yesterday's case where you were emphasizing that this is the center of this case, at least for now, is on syncope. And I think yeah. just is in great contradistinction to yesterday's case where syncope was um, a manifestation of the disease two weeks in. But by selectively using the word single and selectively using the word episode, you're really reminding us of the idea that syncope is probably the crux of this case, although we have to be open to the possibility that in the future, um, uh, you might clarify that the syncope is in the context of something else. But I think the first exercise that happens right now is to ask two questions. Um, is this syncope or is this a syncope mimicker? That's the first question. And that which further HPI will clarify. Um, and the next uh, uh, question is to avoid the dis the uh, phenomenon of a uh, of a distraction, which is to assume that the story begins and ends in the episode. And so you will probably describe to us what happened uh, before the patient uh, um, had his event and what happened afterwards. And yeah. during the process of that, we have to try to figure out what was the pathophysiology of that event and also what happened well before and what will happen well after. And only after that sequence of events is clear can we be confident about what happened to the patient. So my biggest piece of advice is um, with really any episodic disease, once the episode is resolved, you're only left picking up the pieces as to what happened. So while you can study a lot about the difference between pre and post episode and what happened in the middle, equally important is studying the tail on both ends. What happened a year ago, two years ago, and what happened subsequently are equally informative. Mm -hmm. So I'll pass the mic to you um, to give us your next uh, round of data for uh, Prof. Rest to reflect on. Yeah, like uh, it was a first episode and single episode of syncope. And it happened at the morning while the patient was going for the breakfast, uh, like outside of the restaurant. And Syncope was like for a few split second and he regained his consciousness afterward uh, in a split second. And during that event, he didn't hit his head and was able to get up by himself. And and the, however, the patient complained of like associated uh, uh, episodes of generalized weakness since two days. And and he denies any chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitation, uh, any irregularity in heart heart rate, and any swelling or preceding any preceding any vasovagal uh, uh, triggers. And he also denies any abnormal abnormal body movement, urinary or bowel incontinence. Uh, denies any like tongue biting, any weakness, numbness. And, and syncopal episode was not associated with any positional change. And there was no any fever, chills, cough, weight loss.
Prashant, is this a good stopping point or you have more data for this? Yeah, then, uh, should I continue though? Okay. Uh, regarding past medical history, uh, the patient uh, has um, hypertension and hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes, COPD, and, and lumbar stenosis with neurological claudication. And currently he is under uh, the medication atorvastatin uh, 10 mg, uh, albutrol 90 m mcg, metformin, uh, glimepiride, insulin, uh, dulaglutide uh, for his diabetes, uh, metformin, glimepiride, insulin, uh, and dulaglutide. And for his hypertension, he is under benzapril and bistolic. And he is also under morphine, uh, 60 mg, and oxycodone, 10 mg. Um, coming to his uh, surgical history, uh, one year back, he had like C5, C6 anterior cervical disectomy infusion. And two and a half months back, he has uh, L4, L5 laminectomy. So family family history is uh, like uh, not significant and regarding social history he is current smoker with one pack per day for twenty years denies alcohol or substance abuse. Uh, yeah, regarding allergy he has uh, he 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 is not known to have any allergies currently. Yeah, there is no allergy history. Okay, I think this is a great place to stop. And what I'll do is I'll cover the rest of the HPI and then leave the other information for Robbie to discuss. And I think even before you say the word syncope, I think it's really important that you reframe that when you're seeing such patients with the term transient loss of consciousness. That will make sure your mind not only thinks of syncope, but thinks of the syncope mimickers. And when you have transient loss of consciousness, you want to approach it through the most frequent causes. You don't want to start thinking of esoteric etiologies. At this point, no one should be like really considering a rare diagnosis. We see syncope every day. And remember, when we're doing these CPSs, these VMRs, like we're definitely biased that we're going to end up somewhere odd or unusual, but it's a mistake to start with that thought. You really want to train your mind so that this translates into practice in real life. And if this patient were before me in real life, I would say 52-year-old, we'll leave the past medical history for Robbie, with a sudden episode of transient loss of consciousness. When I put transient loss of consciousness, the first two things I think about is syncope and seizure. And the way you tease these two out, um, I think the most helpful thing is like what happens after the event. So if someone is confused after the event, it really prioritizes a seizure. If someone is jerking, prioritizes a seizure, assuming it was a witness event, but realize that post syncope, you can have convulsions as well. The tongue bite, very helpful to prioritize seizure, but based on the information presented, the lack of convulsions, the clarity of thought afterwards, and the lack of tongue laceration between these two most common causes of transient loss of consciousness, syncope is more likely than seizure but you quickly just think about some of the other mimickers. And I would say the next most common mimicker is the other S, psychogenic. It starts with a P, but we spell it with an S. Psychogenic or functional transient loss of consciousness is, is really not that uncommon. I would say, at least in my experience and in my practice, it's syncope, seizure, and then psychogenic. And then there's less common etiologies like a sugar that's low or hypoglycemia. And Moses was the one who taught us of the four S's as an easy way to recall this. So Robbie had said, you really want to study prior to the event, the event, and after the event. If we're now prioritizing syncope, then we think about the causes of syncope. And Seth Sherman taught us about the core causes, C-O-R, 
of syncope. This is cardiogenic, orthostatic, and reflex mediated. The fact that Prashant told us this patient didn't have any postural related lightheadedness, it really lessens the likelihood of orthostatic. The, the interesting thing is it's in the morning and reflex mediated, honestly, is probably the most common of these three buckets. If you're applying the base rate in all comers, like a population base rate approach in clinical reasoning. Uh, so you always have to be open to reflex mediated. Then in the cardiogenic, you can break it down into structural and rhythm disturbances. Um, with the structural stuff like aortic stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, et cetera, usually there's other symptoms that precede. It doesn't happen like that. So if this is in the cardiac bucket, I would favor like a rhythm fast or slow as being more likely the culprit. What to do with those two days of weakness? I'm not sure because a lot of people, it's so nonspecific, but all that does for me is when I do the physical exam, I'm going to assess the physical strength and see, is it actually objective weakness where I have to try to localize along the neuromuscular access or is it just non-specific weakness? Right now, I can't incorporate that. I'm really grounding myself in common things being common. I'm worried about syncope. I have to make sure there's not a cardiac etiology. I need an EKG. I'm, I'm gonna listen to the heart for a murmur, um, but then be open to reflex mediated. But I'm not yet ready to move away from base rate but sometimes Rob is able to pick up nuances and he moves us away from base rate early on. So I'm really curious to hear what my uh, uh, other brother has to say. Well, Fred, I, I think that's absolutely superb. I love the fact that like you're ground, grounding us in the reality of taking care of these patients and mitigating um, VMR bias. And I think there's also another bias that you're bringing up, which is that if somebody has a syncopal episode for whatever reason, if you ask them how they've been feeling, odds are they're going to scrutinize their history with a little bit more detail and say, you know what, maybe I wasn't feeling great the last couple of days. And I bet you that most most of the time when you're feeling a little bit like you're run down and then you subsequently get a URI, you're probably like, oh, that was a warning that I was going to get the URI when many of those days actually are just the natural variation of how you feel. And so I think that two days of generalized weakness is too nonspecific to be like, oh, that definitely is part of the clinical syndrome. Or it may be just that the patient is exaggerating how he was feeling uh, as a normal response to subsequently having had a syncopal or loss of consciousness episode. Um, but I, I bring this up because I think um, within all the S's that Profress outlined, sometimes with the HPI, you can lock into what you think is going on because the HPI is so good. The patient ha came in, had focal motion abnormalities, then had generalized abnormalities and has a tongue lack. And so you're locking in in that scenario to seizure. And so what you'll do is you'll probably scrutinize the medical history with that S as your target. And you might say, okay, diabetes and seizure, hmm, brain abscess, stroke with seizure, like so on and so forth. And the fact that these are so many conditions that can be mapped onto any one of those S's. And the problem is here is, should we try to connect them to syncope alone? Or should the two days of generalized weakness open the doors for other connections? And I think the honest answer is, I don't know. In real life, we would probably have an exam and an EKG to help us say, are we really getting into syncope or are we going to think of the other things? But since this is also a teaching conference, I'll say that maybe we can uh, practice the teaching, the associations with syncope afterwards, but I'll just share with you some reflex thoughts. And the reflex thoughts are diabetes and a lot of hypoglycemic medications. Should we worry about hypoglycemia, especially since the patient seemed to have had this event before he had eaten? But then the other more important thing. And the diagnosis that I'm realizing I've missed many a times is an S that we has made it onto our schema that Ravi emphasizes a lot and was part of an energy MCPS case, which is sleep. And I say that because when a patient is on impressive doses of opiate medications, you wonder if the if really this is just accumulation of opiate toxicity to the point where the patient's nodding off and falling asleep. Could it be that in the morning he woke up on an empty stomach, took his morphine, took his, took his oxycodone, and fell asleep? Um, so those are the other considerations that I'm having is I, I think Prof Rez is appropriately locked on to syncope. The, in retrospect, we might remove that label be, and because the generalized weakness turns out to be something of significance. Odds are it's not. Um, but the medical history opens up the door to, in addition to syncope, thinking about hypoglycemia with the diabetic medications, and I would say opiate-induced um, uh, sleep slash fogginess uh, is also on the radar, and honestly, probably an under-recognized condition. 
Robbie, can I just share a quick story? Yeah, I please. The point, point you made. I, I was a second year resident in San Francisco, rounding with the cardiology team. And all, all of a sudden the nurse jumped out of a patient's room and said, the patient is unresponsive. So I go in there and she's sitting in a chair. Mm. I palpate her radio artery. I don't really sense a pulse, but who knows? I pick mm. her up. And I put her on the ground and I start CPR and within like a second of me initiating CPR. She like literally slaps me and like waves at me. And then I go look at the telly and it was all normal. She was just asleep. Oh my gosh. <laughs> she was just asleep. So I got to put this other SMI schema, man, because like think about common things being common. Like I love that possibility of like too much opiates and just. Are you sure she was asleep or, asleep or did the, the magic of prof res give her life again? I don't know. <laughs> I think both are possible. <laughs> wow, what a story. <laughs> and, and to this date, it's only, my only successful resuscitation of, of effort. <laughs> Rashawn, I told you, I warned you. <laughs> just, just give us more data, please. <laughs> uh, like, uh, before going to the vitals, I want to like uh, give you a few like extra uh, data um, regarding review of uh, system. Uh, yeah, yeah, during review of system, there was lethargy and generalized weakness. As said earlier, and the patient also complained of um, occasional constipation. And and uh, the dose regarding the dose of morphine and oxycodone, I think uh, the morphine dose is like uh, is under sixty mg eight to twelve hours every eight to twelve hours, and oxycodone ten mg every eight hours. So yeah, um, let that's that's the extra information. So like I will um, proceed to the vitals right now. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, his temp uh, regarding temperature, uh, he was febrile, um, and uh, blood pressure was uh, seventy by forty nine mmHg at the time of presentation. And uh, respiratory rate was uh, normal, sixteen, and heart rate was uh, ninety five beats per minute. Saturation one hundred percent at the at the room here. And weight was uh, seventy three point eight kg. His BMI was like normal. Should I proceed further? Yes, please. Why don't you just give it? Yeah, your... yeah, yeah. Coming to the examination, uh, uh, the patient was a middle aged man, well built, well nourished, uh, like laying comfortably in the bed, not in acute distress. Um. Uh, and uh, head, and, head and neck examinations were all normal. Uh, like uh, there was no any like uh, nephropathy, no carotid bridge, uh, neck was supple. And uh, regarding cardiovascular examinations, the rate was normal uh, and rhythm was also normal. No murmur, no gallop, no rub, no peripheral edema. Distal pulse were strong and equal in all limbs. Uh, regarding um, pulmonary examination, um, the patient was not in respiratory distress. The lungs were clear to auscultation and percussion with good air exchange. No labor breathing, no crackles, no wheezes. And regarding abdomen examinations, um, it was soft, non distended, but there was a tenderness in the right upper quadrant and right flank region uh, during the examination. However, there was no any rebound tenderness, no mass, no organomegaly. Bowel sound were hard. Uh, only the pertinent finding was tenderness at the right upper quadrant and right flank region. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Go ahead, please. No, no, please finish. Yeah. Oh. Uh, the the neuro neurological examination was all normal, and yeah, extremities uh, and skin were warm, dry, and pink. No rash lesion. All, all, all the thing was uh, normal. The only pertinent finding was tenderness at the right upper quadrant and right flank. Absolutely amazing and very, very instructive exam. But Prashant, I just want to commend you for one thing, which is that you're you're telling the story in such an in, in very intriguing way, telling chapter by chapter by chapter. But I think what's most telling that I would love everyone to pay attention to is how much you're paying attention to the scribe uh, and helping the scribe keep up. Um, our beloved Sammy is scribing today with half, half a hand. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. Prof, I'll maybe just tackle the vitals and then pass the exam to you. And um, the vitals strike me for, for three reasons. The first is the part that it's in red. It's the blood pressure is low. 
And I think that gives credence to the idea that this is a cardiovascular phenomenon and that the patient, in fact, does have a, did have a transient loss of consciousness, probably owing to even worse hypotension at that point. So I think Prof. Rez's intuition has been strongly supported. Um, and so the question is, what kind of mechanism from syncope max, maps on to persistent hypotension? And I think if you go back to all the categories, you're like, there's cardiac, there's hypovolemia, there's orthostatic, and there's vasovagal. The only thing that is markedly reduced in probability with ongoing hypotension well after the episode is vasovagal. That's transient. The other thing that's much less likely to be ongoing is in arrhythmia because the heart rate does not suggest it. Because if the arrhythmia is ongoing, you would probably be able to see the ongoing tacky or ongoing Brady components of it. The caveat may be that the patient is actually going very, very fast, but is only having some perfusing beats, fooling the heart rate machine into thinking the heart rate is actually 95 when it is maybe 195. That concept is really important to understand. It's called pseudo bradycardia, where your heart's going so fast that only a fraction of those beats are perfusing and only a fraction of them reach the pulse oximeter, thus fooling you that the heart rate is lower than it actually is. But you will notice that when you put your stethoscope on the patient that their heart will be going very, very fast. So persistent hypotension in a patient with syncope who has a normal heart rate makes arrhythmogenic and vasovagal causes less likely. What do those two things have in common? Those are brief zaps in electrical discharges, either from the heart or from the vagus nerve, and they usually go away quickly. So what are we left with? We're, we're left with saying, is this a cardiogenic, is this a, um, a structural cardiogenic cause? Is this a volume cause? Or is this a, a vessel clamp or orthostatic cause? And if you're being strategic about your analysis, you're saying the patient doesn't have any structural abnormalities on my exam. So I'm going to put that a little bit less likely. The patient has no overt signs so far that we've heard of a volume loss. So should I start to focus my energy on the orthostatic non-volume component? And I'll just leave it at that from the, the schema to tell you that there's an additional mechanism that supports the orthostatic vessel clamp hypothesis. And that's that the blood pressure is 70 and the heart rate is only 95. I learned this concept on VMR from Yusuf. And one of his management reasoning uh, uh, discussions where he talked about what, you, what inferences you can make on uh, very high heart rate with a relatively normal blood pressure and I'm just going to do this rapid fire star style because I don't think there's time to explain it. Rapid fire association, super high heart rate, but relatively normal blood pressure in a patient with presyncope. Shreyas taught this, taught us this. That's POTS. Uh, uh, appropriately normal heart rate for a low blood pressure, that is basically hypovolemia. A inappropriately normal or low heart rate for a patient who is hypotensive beta blocker, autonomic dysfunction, or adrenal insufficiency. So let's stay true to the principles that Prof. Rez told us to be honest about what progress we've made and what the base rate is. The base rate of persistent hypotension in a patient with syncope prioritizes a structural cause or a volume cause because those are both common and morbid. So in this patient, we'll need a more detailed structural analysis because our exam is not enough. We'll probably give this patient fluid to see how well he responds, and that's the base rate. But there are some clues that are accumulating to the a less common hypothesis of impaired vessel clamp. And those clues so far are a lack of structural findings on exam and a lack of structural features on history which would be subacute progressive symptoms like we had yesterday. The lack of volume loss, so nothing to support diarrhea, diuretics, so on and so forth. So we have to zoom in to the vessel clamp hypothesis. And the vessel clamp hypothesis, are there meds on board that the patient is impairing their vessel clamp and the ACE inhibitor is one, no beta blockers? Or is it one of the two A's, autonomic dysfunction, or adrenal insufficiency.
much rarer, too soon to engage them, but enough features to start to wonder and prepare for that possibility should the fluids not help or not help enough? And should the structural assessment, beginning with an EKG and then probably an echo if necessary, should those not pan out? All right, Prof. Rezma, Mike to you, my friend. I thought that was beautiful. I love the heart rate and blood pressure and the DDX that it prioritizes. I've never heard it like that. Um, record it for RLR, please. I am gonna give the attention that the right upper quadrant pain deserves. And that's not much. It's not much. I, I think it would be inauthentic in real life if I were to try to map on the right upper quadrant tenderness to the hypotension. So we'll track that piece of data and likely it will be explained by the final diagnosis, but I don't wanna to dive too deeply into that. I think just to maybe mention one possibility, you can imagine someone has tampon on, congestion of the liver, right upper quadrant pain, and they're in cardiogenic shock. Another possibility, you can have a ret retroperitoneal hemorrhage. So internal volume loss leading to hypovolemia, leading to hypotension. Um, you can have other uh, possibilities to connect it to, but I just don't wanna do that yet. I think at this point, like from a management reasoning perspective, one, it's so hard to predict hypotension until you actually measure the blood pressure because you don't need much of a systolic blood pressure to have normal mentation. So very difficult. The only markers that patients may report is this sense of, oh, I passed out or I don't, I feel very nonspecific. They may say my urine output is down. And you on physical exam may actually feel cold extremities. It's very important to touch the extremities like Prashant did, because that's gonna be your clue to cardiogenic shock or advanced septic shock. I would go to the bedside and I would literally raise the leg as I'm giving this patient one liter of fluid as rapidly as I could. The leg stores about 250 to 500 cc's of fluid. So I, you do this many times, just keep it elevated, repeat the blood pressure, see if they're fluid responsive. So Prashant, please give us more data, but I think, um, just using Robbie's schema and being practical, all these patients are going to get an EKG. They're all going to get a troponin. They're all going to get a lactate. They're all going to get a CMP to look at the kidney function. And then all of them unequivocally, when they're stable, will get an echo. And in this patient, maybe the abdominal pain will prompt us to get some abdominal imaging as well. Yeah. Yeah. You are right. Uh, we like started our investigation with a. Um, blood count uh wbc was 9.4 uh, which was a normal limit and hemoglobin was uh 13.4 again normal uh hematocrit uh was 37.4 and platelet was 234 and it was the blood count was completely normal and cmp a panel um, compressed metabolic panel uh, the sodium was 134 Potassium four, chloride hundred, bicarb twenty one, and um, urea uh, urea was uh, nineteen, and creatinine was one point two. So so creatinine was slightly elevated from the range. Uh, it was it is like one point one in the normal range, and it is slightly elevated one point two. Uh, that's it. Like urea was in like in the. Uh, upper uh, border of the normal range urea and random blood sugar like we were like uh, there was one differential uh, regarding the medication induced hypoglycemia random blood, uh, blood glucose was 194 it was slightly raised and coming to the uh, liver function test uh, ast was 17 alt 25 uh, alkaline phosphatase 78 Total bilirubin uh, 0 0.4, uh, direct bilirubin 0 0.15, all were normal. And coming to the uh, marker, troponin. Troponin was slightly elevated, 95. Uh, the normal range was less than 40, so slightly elevated troponin, 95. Lactic acid was highly elevated, 4.5. And 
we also did uh, thyroid function test. Uh, uh, T4 was 1.55 and TSH uh, was 0 0.34. So TSS was slightly on the lower side, but T4 was in the normal range. Uh, the TSS uh, range was 0 0.4 to 4, uh, and our like TSS came out to be 0 0.340. And uh, so, yeah, uh, TSS was slightly in the lower range, and urine, urine analysis was unremarkable. Coming to the imaging, um, uh, EKG was done and it shows a normal sinus rhythm at the heart rate of 91 beats per minute. Chest X-ray, normal, unremarkable. Uh, CT head was also done, uh, CT head and cervical spine uh, CT was also done because of the past history of surgery, which came out to be unremarkable. And CT chest with PE pro protocol was also done, which was also negative, unremarkable. No pulmonary embolism. And uh, our like GI investigation, GI imaging, CT contrast, CT abdomen and pelvis uh, was done, which showed dilated biliary system with common bile duct measuring up to 1.6 centimeter. And additional other finding were non-obstructive right renal calculus and moderate clo uh, colonic stool burden. So these were the three findings. Uh, CBD was dilated up to 1.6 cent, uh, centimeter, uh, non-obstructive right renal calculus, and moderate colonic stool bottle. Now the pertinent finding among the like uh, imaging was only the CT abdomen pelvis contrast, contrast CT abdomen pelvis. So wow, um, Prashan, this was very helpful. Can I ask you just one question for the white mm -hmm. count? Do you know what the eosinophil count was? Was it low or was it normal? No, the like, neutrophil count, lymphocyte count was all all in the normal range. The I was also like uh, wondering what like lactic acid is like uh, too high, like uh, pointing to other sepsis, but the count is normal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, very very helpful. Um, maybe like Robbie, we can tackle this together. I'll just share my preliminary thoughts, and I would love your feedback on this. One is the CBC, I think the Y count was, you, you know, it was really important to look at the diff. And the reason it's important is the following. Robbie said, we have every reason to worry about the less common causes of hypotension being autonomic insufficiency and adrenal insufficiency. With adrenal insufficiency, you literally don't have endogenous steroids. And if you don't have endogenous steroids, your eosinophils won't undergo apoptosis. So in anyone who is hypotensive, they really have to be eosinopenic because they should have a cortisol response to the hypotension. So if you ever see someone with a slight elevation in eosinophil and hypotension, this is probably your diagnosis um, or it should be considered and it should be considered uh, uh, a strong possibility. Um, the other thing that would be helpful as you're starting to say, hey, could this be adrenal insufficiency is you look at the bicarb, but you know you can't really interpret that bicarb of 21. There's a slight anion gap acidosis, the only acid-based disorder you can interpret off that BMP. And we have an explanation for that being that elevated lactate. But if we didn't have an elevated lactate and we had a VBG with um, an acidosis and it was metabolic, then you're starting to make a case for adrenal insufficiency through another lens, being that you don't have that uh, aldosterone hormone to secrete the hydrogen ion in the distal nephron. Uh, the, the troponin is not surprising, Prashan, because this guy has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, probably has coronary artery disease. This is a huge stress to the heart. You perfuse the myocardium during diastole and you need a diastolic pressure of like 45 or so. So I would chalk this up to demand as opposed to the hardest hit. Uh, the patient didn't have any chest pain. The EKG didn't show any ST elevation. And this troponin, I would say, hey, this is just and sequela of hypotension. The lactate being elevated has confirmed shock so you can be normotensive and have and be in shock, or you can be hypotensive and not be in shock. This patient is shocked. 
because of the uh, end organ dysfunction. And that creatinine may creep up even more. Um, it'll be interesting to see what their response to the fluid was. And then, Rob, I, I, I think that um, this CT scan is interesting with the biliary dilation. I would love to know how you're reconciling that or thinking about it. Well, I mean, I think prof res, what I'm most intrigued about is honestly what's going to happen to the patient. Because here we are, we have a patient in front of us who has soft blood pressures. We're probably giving them some, some fluids. And we found no cardiovascular consequences uh, in, the, in terms of the EKG and any structural issues with the CT. And I'm just watching, uh, I, in real life, I'd be watching this patient. And I'd be like, what are the chances that this is going to happen again on our watch that you're going to have, that he's going to have another episode of syncope on our watch, right? As we watch, is he going to have another arrhythmia? Is he going to have, I bet the chances are super low. You know, you expect somebody who came from, uh, from essentially death store, super low blood pressure, who is recovering by himself and who you get an EKG on, it looks fine. You scan his head, it looks fine. You scan his chest, it looks fine. You're like what's, what's happening here? And um, when everything is coming away and you're not getting a heavy dose of something structural or a heavy dose of something uh, arrhythmogenic, um, you wonder what is, is it something that's coming from outside his body? That's something that happened into his environment that's causing that. And the, another support for that, I think, is his CT findings. And I'll summarize by saying his, this, this is a CT finding of somebody with high, high, high dose and high opiate use. Let me try to explain. Um, when we think about uh, extrahepatic biliary obstruction, often invoked by a biliary dilation, we think of three causes. External compression, such that would occur with a pancreatic cancer, which is an important consideration here. Disease of the wall, such that would occur in PSC, or internal diseases like stones. So, external obstruction, wall disease, luminal disease. Each of those three categories has equal in number three falsely localizing causes of common bile duct dilation, meaning that the CBD dilation is completely a distractor. What are those three? The first is age. The older you are, the, the more dilated your common bile duct. And a good correction is to use the decade and multiply that by millimeters. So a patient with at 50 should have five millimeters. A patient at 90 should have nine millimeters. Big difference. The other is a history of cholecystectomy. The removal of the gallbladder no longer allows for a lot of bile to be stored in the gallbladder. And instead, it stretches the common bile duct. What's the third? Opiates. In fact, we use this fact to diagnose cholecystitis by giving patients with, uh, with uh, possible cholecystitis morphine to tense up their sphincter of ODI to see if their HIDA scan will be possible. So we use this fact on a frequent basis in medicine. So if you look at the scan, you're like, there's moderate colonic stool burden, and there's a dilated biliary system in the setting of a completely normal hepatic enzyme profile, you wonder if this patient has a mimic of extrahepatic disease, not true extrahepatic disease. And you start to wonder, is this patient's opiate consequences so high that they're causing such severe constipation and such severe stasis on the abdomen? And is the calculus as a result of the not infrequent poor PO and dehydration that accompanies the sedation with opiate use? So for me, I'm looking at this and saying, how aggressively do we need to follow up all these leads? Is this a stone issue that you and I spent many, many uh, hours thinking about stone issues when they're part of a systemic disease based on a recent RLR? Do we follow the biliary lead or do we step back and watch what happens and wonder and talk about, is this the opiates here? And I'm inclined really to just give the patient some fluids pause, reassess, and monitor. And my prediction is that no subsequent episodes of syncope uh, will occur in the hospital. And that would really, really reinforce the conversation that an exogenous trigger is largely contributory, which would then um, allow for a more informed conversation around these, the effects of these medications. If, however, 
his liver and liver enzyme profile were to evolve, his pain were to evolve, or the syndrome were to take off in any way, shape, or form, you would have to uh, discard this hypothesis completely and then go back and reanalyze all the data. Um, but that's where I'm at authentically. Um, how does that land with you, Prof Rez? Beautiful, man. I, I love that hypothesis. And I think that disconnect of ALK-FOS elevation with the dilation is a false localization and shouldn't be part of that PR that we're forming in our head. Well, I hope we're, I hope I didn't lead us astray, but this is what I would do in real life. But I would say that none of this you can say with confidence. I think the next step is not to be scared to give the patient fluids and to watch what happens. That would that would be it. Yeah, over the uh, over the course of the hospital stay, the patient was given fluids, and the hypertension medication was on hold, uh, as well as the the opioid medication was on hold, uh, and the patient improved. Actually, the patient improved, but. <laughs> uh, uh, to the surprise, like the patient at the night, patient had another episode of hypotension, and the critical care team was like consulted uh, because he, he was he, like the, his blood pressure was extremely low, and and when I like when I got uh, when I when I get to see the patient in the morning, I saw the like there was a critical care note uh, due to the like life threatening hypertension. Hypertension, it was like it was recurring, and and again the fluid was given, and he was stabilized. And along the hospital course, uh, the blood culture uh, came out to be negative. Blood culture was negative. And lactic acid over the 24 hours, uh, it like uh, it uh, decreases from 4.5 to 3.6, 3.6 to 2.5, and then to one within the 24 hours. And troponin as well after the fluid resuscitation, it uh, came down from 95 to 56, 56 to 35, normal over the 24 hours. And like same goes to the creatinine, uh, which was slightly elevated, 1.2. It came came uh, down to like 0 0.69 in 24 hours. So within 24 hours, all the vitals, which were like deranged, lactic acid, troponin, creatine, which all came to the normal and blood culture was negative. And, um, and, and the patient had that uh, episode of, uh, again, low blood pressure uh, at night time. And next day, like, um, we were really concerned about the CBD dilation, why the CBD dilation was taking place. And we, and the USC was also done, which shows the same finding. There was, uh, it, it didn't show any stone. There was dilated CBD in USC. And we, like, we opted to, like, do a MRCP scan which showed um, post-obstructive dilation of CVD up to 14 mm. And uh, it was obstructed by a protruding intraluminal uh, nodule of 9 mm in MRCP. Uh, it was located in intrapancreatic portion of CVD. Um, the 9 mm uh, intraluminal nodule was uh, present in the intrapancreatic intra portion of CVT, and there was no feature of any gallstone in MRCP. So, oh, amazing, very, very intriguing. Uh, Prof. Rez, I feel like I talked a lot. I'm really curious what your thoughts are. Thank, thank you. you. You knew I wanted to speak, and <laughs> you're the best. I, I, um, I think. There's a very important teaching point here, Robbie, that the outcome of a case doesn't necessarily correlate with the quality of clinical reasoning, meaning the case can unfold exactly like you predicted or you can land on a diagnosis, but the reasoning was faulty, or the case can unfold unpredictably, but the reasoning was solid. And like what I just wanted to applaud you for was keeping it so authentic, like 99 out of 100 times, this patient would not have another episode. And it would all be the opiates, and that would be the end of it. But now, you said we got to watch the patient. If there's another episode, then we pivot and we go down a separate trajectory. And this case comes down to this 
one fact. And even before we talk about the MRCP results, this is now recurrent, episodic hypotension that is self-limited. Recurrent, ep and maybe the, the, you know, um, prior to learning the MRCP results, I would have included the nocturnal component, Ravi, just thinking of autonomic activity being higher, you know, parasympathetic activity. But with the, the findings on MRCP, I'm going to reconsider. But if you ask the question, what can cause episodic hypotension? Just go to your buckets. You have cardiogenic, obstructive, distributive, and hypovolemic. We know we're not in hypovolemic. Put that out. We actually know we're not in cardio, like what cardiogenic cause may be an arrhythmia, but this patient was on telemetry and we didn't capture an arrhythmic etiology. Tamponade, myocarditis, myocardium, none of that is going to be episodic like this and just get better with fluid. By the way, I'm not focused on the lactate or the troponin because the lactate is type A lactic acidosis and it's a consequence of the hypotension. I have a good explanation yeah. for that. So I'm yeah. eliminating the cardiogenic bucket altogether, rhythm and structural. By the way, Prashant, I just wanted to applaud you for evaluating for a PE. 10% of the PEs present with syncope. And you and that this could have been a great story for pulmonary embolus at time point zero. Let's eliminate the hypovolemic category, Robbie. Let's eliminate the obstructive. There's no tamponade. There's no PE. This is in the distributive. And in the distributive, the most common cause is sepsis, but let's eliminate sepsis because there's nothing going for sepsis. And that's more monophasic, not episodic. So in the episodic distributive causes of syncope, you're at anaphylaxis, but anaphylaxis does not get better with fluid. It's mm -hmm. an epi-responsive disorder due to um, mast cell degranulation of histamine, not bradykinin. Uh, then you're also in the neurogenic, like if this was a weird case of the patient turns his head and he had all this spinal surgery and it activates the parasympathetic and then causes hypotension, we're like, oh, cool, wow, now we have an additional ideology and it's totally feasible, right? Like the positioning of the patient. But then we have to incorporate this little mass that we find in the, near the pancreas. And this little mass makes you wonder, are you dealing with the neuroendocrine tumor that is just discharging um, a, you know, a product like serotonin or um, something else that may cause episodic vasodilation and syncope? So where I am, Robbie, is like, I think I, I really wanna incorporate this mass and this mass, I want, I'm not worried about it necessarily being an adenocarcinoma, to be frank, um, because I wouldn't ex expect these episodic um, episodes of hypotension. I'm really worried about a neuroendocrine tumor. Those are usually in the small intestines, and they actually have to bypass the liver, like if we're thinking of carcinoid, to leave an imprint, because the liver is really good at metabolizing the serotonin, so you don't get the vasodilation. Uh, the other thing I'm thinking about is the whole autonomic insufficiency. Like, is this mass a red herring or is it true, true and unrelated? Meaning, do you have like a cholangiocarcinoma plus an autonomic disturbance? And in that autonomic disturbance, um, this is where I would think of the less common, diabetes can cause autonomic insufficiency, but this would be odd for that. Thinking of amyloid, specifically like AL amyloid can cause autonomic insufficiency. But for me, if I'm being very honest, I'm prioritizing this mass and thinking of a neuroendocrine process leading to an episodic disturbance to the cardiovascular system. But I would love to hear your thoughts, because I think now we do have to entertain esoteria given this presentation. I'm glad that we're entertaining esoteria at the end, Prof. Rez, and I, and I, I love your formulation. You're like recurrent um, cryptogenic uh, obstruct uh, distributive shock. Think of the two A's, adrenal insufficiency, which we thought of, but I think should probably test for, but with the hyperglycemia, normal natremia makes it, it seems unlikely though his opiate use is a risk factor for that, uh, for central um, adrenal insufficiency. Um, and then anaphylactoid reactions, not anaphylaxis, but anaphylactoid reactions most commonly from neuroendocrine tumors. But then um, 
I think the if you ask yourself, can I stretch the anaphylactoid uh, reaction differential diagnosis? And it gets shorter and shorter. But I had one question from Prashant, which was around where he's seeing. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, let me uh, tell you why I'm asking you, and then I'll ask you the question. So if we're thinking what causes anaphylactoid reactions, especially centered on the pancreas, neuroendocrine tumor, neuroendocrine tumor, neuroendocrine tumor, um, but partly biased by wondering if this patient is from um, Nepal, started to also wonder about um, whether this person has parasitic disease and whether he has a biliary fluke or, um, or uh, a parasite like um, uh, ascariasis, anisochiasis, or, uh, uh, or there's... <laughs> We're going to call you the world yeah. diagnostician, man. Look at you, yeah, like, you're yeah. practicing in Nepal, man. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just curious. I, I don't think it would be... A, I, I don't no, know. No, yeah, yeah, is this? I saw, a... I, I saw this case uh, during my rotation uh, in the Mestral Hospital at the Baltimore. I see. And this was a case of the US, US case, yeah. Yeah, so it's a little bit less likely to deal to be dealing yeah. with parasitic diseases, though an immigration pattern maybe. Um, yeah, I completely agree with you, Prof. Rez. I think that the fact that this is ongoing merits close evaluation, and I think um, the two A's would be highest priority for me. Is this person having an anaphylactoid-like reaction? Again, mm -hmm. uh, very similar to the mast cell diseases we've had, but here the pancreatic center of that, I think, would prioritize evaluation for a neuroendocrine tumor for sure. Yeah. So, Prashant, I was, I was wondering. wondering can I just like, say one more what? thing, Prashant. Sorry, because this is like a really important teaching point. Patients may actually take substances in the hospital. Like, just be aware of that. Like, if this patient mm -hmm. had a friend come in and inject something, like I've seen it. But there was no other yeah. manifestation of that, like pinpoint pupils and stuff like that. No, no. I have seen the cases like uh, the partners and friends being the like uh, drug in the hospital. I have, I have encountered that cases also during my rotation. And on our case, like the patient was irritable because the patient was not like getting the pain medications, the opioid medication. We have like tap them. Uh, we tap the pain medications and he was irritated. His pain was not that much adequately controlled uh, as previous. So that suggests that he doesn't have any like um, outer source. Also the finding of pinpoint people was not there and and he was irritated uh, at, at the time and he was like also shocked with the result of the imaging. And I'm also wondering that why the previous CT abdomen uh, didn't show any mass and the MRCV showed the mass? That's also one of like curious point. And we we, we were like uh, the uh, uh, the hospitalist and I was like discussing the case and we were super confused and we like thought to pursue the expert consultation of GI and GI consulted uh, the patient and they recommended the endoscopic ultrasound, mm, but we could not perform on that the very day. And on the next day, we performed the endoscopic ultrasound. And to our surprise, like uh, <laughs> endoscopic ultrasound shows the dilation of CBD up to 9 mm. The CBD, uh, CBD dilation, uh, which uh, like initially the CBD dilation was uh, 16 mm, and then it came down to 14 mm in uh, MRCP with 9 mm nodule. And on endoscopic ultrasound, it was, the dilation was 9 mm. And there was no any pathology in the common bile duct. <laughs> uh, John, why are you doing this to us? Why? <laughs> I think it's fascinating. Uh... I don't know if you intended to stop there, but um, I will uh, I will let you finish, but tell you this case is giving me, uh, my CBD is probably this big now, just, just listening to your case. Oh my gosh. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, like there was no any significant pathology in ampulla, pancreatic head, genu, and body. And there was no any significant pathology in this gall bladder. Like the only CBD was elevated and the, um, the nodule, which was 9 mm, like, disappeared in like within two days. And like, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah. maybe maybe uh, I can just ask you, Prashant, for the sake of time, how much more uh, information do you have before the you will reveal the diagnosis? Like that's it. Uh, we this is it, like, huh? uh, yeah, this okay, is the information. Okay. So this is the last time that Prof Rez and I can discuss. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll share what my thoughts in uh zero words, and those thoughts are. Um, and that's all. Um, is this a migrat migrating stone that comes and goes? Or is this all the consequences of 
a mimicker of CBD dilation, which is the opiates. And I think that um, is very, very hard to tease out. I will just share that I am using the fact that this patient almost died. He had syncope, no blood pressure, and now is stable enough to tolerate an endoscopy with uh, endoscopic ultrasound. Stable enough to do an invasive procedure and the treatment in between, fluids. How do we take somebody from death's door, syncope, with their help, he recovered by himself, and we take them all the way to an end of basic procedure, anesthesia, and only difference is fluids. I think that tells you that the thing that you're looking for is something that can tolerate just that as an intervention. Significant cardiovascular issues, hard to imagine. Adrenal insufficiency, hard to imagine tolerating that if you present a syncope. If you don't present a syncope, yeah. So that those are my thoughts. My thoughts are to recognize the pattern of chronic opiate use on CT scan and to use what has happened as a clue to uh, to the patients. So I would be most worried about opiates in this issue in large part because of the minimal supportive therapy needed to have a patient tolerate a very advanced endoscopic procedure. Where, where are you at, Prof? Ray? I'm going to listen. Yeah, I think uh, we, we sat down and discussed the case and we finally concluded the opioid was the main culprit. It was the culprit for the low blood pressure as well as the culprit for the uh, constipation the patient had. And also there is a, uh, the opioid directly caused the, um, uh, impaired the motility of the gallbladder. So we thought the nodule detected by the MRCP was probably a biliary slurs, which was there. And when like over the course of like four or five days, the patient was staying in the hospital, we taper down the, we like discontinued the opioid and, uh, and it like the patient start to like resume the motility of the biliary tract and the slurs was like clear itself. We thought like we concluded uh, like by dis like discussing the case uh, among ourselves, we concluded that the, all the culprit was the opioid and GI also um, suggested to like do the MR MRCP uh, three months later uh, to see if there there, there is a reappearance of any mass or not uh, for to be on a safe side. But um, we like, we conclude that the, we conclude the diagnosis to be opioid induced hypotension, biliary dyskinesia, as well as constipation. I absolutely love this case so, so much because this is the type of cases we see day in and day out. And just, you know, I, I think it's just so practical and so relevant. Question for you and for Robbie, um, how do you explain that recurrent episode of hypotension that occurred? Because that's what like threw us off, you know, and the patient didn't just get better. I would, curious to what you think and what Robbie thinks. Oh, uh, Prashant, I, I'll just, I, I don't know, actually, to be honest with you, I think, um, uh, um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. I think it'd be curious. I wonder if it was similar to your story, Prof Rez. Uh, sometimes nocturnal hypotension is true nocturnal hypotension, or sometimes it's noc nocturnal hypotension is somebody sleeping and their blood pressure cuff is measuring the bed and not measuring their arm. And I've, I swear I've seen that. Like you come in the room, the blood pressure is like, 30 over something. And it's because the blood pressure is not on the patient's arm. Um, I think the learning that you can have with that is twofold. Either the data is inaccurate or that, you know, if you go from the medications causing syncope, i.e. non-perfusing blood pressure, what can you expect to happen if you start to treat the disease? Should you expect it to just go from that to normal right away? Or can you have some wiggle room for an in intermediate presentation, like almost died, hypotension requiring fluids, normal. So um, I don't know is the honest answer. And I think the possibilities are the data is inaccurate or that the disease process was partially treated by that point, uh, only to then be fully treated once the patient uh, had spent more time in the hospital. But it easily could have been something else, you know, you just had to see how many episodes were going to happen. Was it just going to be one? I'm sure that people would have not tolerated two or three or four, but in retrospect, um, he clearly was able to tolerate something much more serious. And so 
I don't know. I'm just, these are all just my speculative thoughts. I, I'm curious what yours were, uh, Prashant. Yeah, like um, uh, the oxycodone, like it is not associated with the uh, hypertension. I like, um, I, I saw uh, it was not associated, but morphine was associated with the hypertension. And like, um, as a like a country, as, as a doctor, we practicing in the US, uh, there are a lot of opioid cases. And we should be like aware of the um, back of the mind. Uh, the, one of the cause of hypotension is drug induced and the most common of abuse drug is opioid in the US. So uh, probably we should also be like thinking uh, while while considering the syncope, we should also con consider about syn drug induced opioid uh, hypotension. And, and it was like interesting because the the opioid was affecting every systems and it was presenting everywhere, GI, biliary tract and cardiovascular. And it was interesting to like have these all symptoms at, at the same time. R rumor has it they're still waiting for that 5-H-I-A-A in the urine to come back. <laughs> Just joking. Thanks for the presentation. Ayesha, take us home. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Prashant, for this amazing case and Prof. Reza and Ravi. I, you continue to amaze me how much in knowledge you have and how you educate us every single day. So thank you for that. For our teaching points today, we have a 52-year-old male patient with a single episode of syncope. So when we think of syncope, we have to think about if it's true syncope or a mimicker. And we need to avoid the distraction in terms of we need to think about where the story began and where it and where it ended within that one episode. We need to think about what happened before, during the episode, and after the episode. So we we also have to think about uh, rephrase the word syncope and sometimes call it transient loss of consciousness because that can help us think of more causes so it can help us think of think more broadly and when we think of transient loss of conscious consciousness or syncope we have four plus one additional s this time around so we have um syncope we have seizure which can um, a seizure and when we have confusion after an event, we need to prioritize seizure, especially if there's jerking movement, tongue biting. So depending on what happened depend, uh, during the event, we, need, we have to prioritize seizure. It can also be psychogenic or functional, which is not very common. And it can also be hypoglycemia because of sugar. So depending on if they're taking diabetic drugs or in, within the context of that. And the fifth one that we really need to keep in mind is sleep or fogginess. And that can usually happen when patients are taking opioid medications that can cause an accumulation, causing toxicity and causing the patient to kind of just nod off. And when you think about that, think about Prof. Reza's funny story with the patient being lifted up, and you'll remember. <laughs> um, and then we also have to think about core. So these are some of the causes, um, which means cardiogenic, which could be structural from aortic stenosis, or it could be hokum. And it can also be due to rhythmic disturbances. Is, is the rhythm fast or is it slow? Do an ECG and find out. Or it can be orthostatic. And third, it can be reflex mediated, which is the most common in the general population. And in our case, this patient had um, the duration was for two days, which is very nonspecific. So do uh, you can do a physical exam to assess the strength if the patient is complaining of weakness. Is it objective, um, subjective um, weakness? So figure that out. And when we have and HPI, if it's very detailed, very well informative, very detailed, it can very well lead us to a potential answer and lock in um, a differential diagnosis. And when we got our vitals, we saw that the patient had hypotension, which led us to believe that it could be a cardiovascular etiology. And when we think about that a cardiovascular etiology, we want to be thinking about ongoing conditions that can last for a long time, which could be cardiac, hypovolemic, or, or orthostatic. But if we're thinking of a condition that has not been going on for a long time, is very acute, we could be thinking about arrhythmia, arrhythmias. And we were also thinking about pseudobradycardia, which is when the heart is going so fast that the pulse oximeter can only... Um, catch a fraction of the beats that are 
um, coming from the patient. And this can be heard mostly on the stethoscope, mo most commonly. And then the common causes of hypotension uh, we need to think about, it, other than the previous cause that I mentioned, is beta blocker intake, autonomic or adrenal insufficiency. So when we're thinking of adrenal insufficiency, where we have a lack of cortisol, cortisol causes isopenia. In this patient, we did um, the isinophil count was normal. And in adrenal insufficiency, we would suspect it to be increased. So we kind of um, eliminate the adrenal insufficiency as our cause as well. And we our EKG and CT chest was normal, which ruled out cardiovascular, cardiovascular and structural causes for us. So now we're thinking, is it something from outside the body? Then we got our CT findings, which um, and with CT findings, we're thinking of three different things. Could be external compression from pancreatic cancer. It could be a disease of the lumen, set, which can be our PSC, or it could be internal bleeding or stones. And all three of these can cause a falsely localized cause of the CBD dilation, which can be due, which can be due to age. So in a, for example, in a 50 year old patient, um, there, the dilation can be five centimeter or a 90 year old can have nine centimeter. And then we also need to consider the history. If there's a history of cholecystectomy, because the removal of a gallbladder means that the bile is no longer being stored, at, or it could be due to opiates. And in this case, we can give fluids and wait to see what happens, which was also done in our patient. And then we were thinking about a neuroendocrine tumor, which could be discharging a product. It, it could be carcinoid tumor in the small intestine, which could be releasing serotonin and causing an episodic disturbance to the cardiovascular system. And then we were also thinking about anaphylactoid, not anaphylaxis, anaphylactoid reaction from the tumor, which um, could also be the cause here. And then depending on the country where this patient is coming from, uh, we were also thinking of a parasitic disease, but that doesn't, did not apply to our patient because this was in a different location. And then very, very important um, aspect to keep in mind is that patients can also be taking substances within the hospital, which their family, friends could be providing for them, um, a kind of under the table kind of um, uh, condition. And so we also need to keep that in mind. And then when we got our EUS findings with a dilated CBD, we were thinking of either it could be a migrating stone that keeps coming in and then going in and coming in, or it could be a mimicker of opiate intake. And our final culprit, we were bamboozled by the opiate intake and the diagnosis of opiate-induced CBD dilation. And thank you. Bamboozled. I'm bamboozled by your teaching, Aisha. Robbie, sign us out from your mansion, my friend. <laughs> Amazing job, Aisha. That was superb. Prashant, I thank you so much for presenting a common condition on VMR. It's so rare to diagnose a common condition. And we really, really appreciate it. And hope you've inspired many other people to present their UTIs, pneumonia, cellulitis, opiates, um, and other things. It really, really is a, a very important day uh, in VMR. So thank you for bringing it to, uh, to us today. Bye, guys. Yeah, From the it was a pleasure meeting you all. Uh, I had a fun like interacting and like I had a, I got the different views, uh, learning the same cases. And I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful for this opportunity. Bye-bye. You should join us Have more nice often. Hope to see you, okay? Bye -bye. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.